You're walking home from therapy after getting diagnosed with astrophobia and astromegalophobia. You always knew something was up, but you never realized it was the fear of space and large celestial objects. It feels like a relief to know why you were always so scared of watching those horror YouTube videos about planets waking up. Wait, Kyle? You had these phobias all this time? No wonder you were always so scared during our trips. I feel terrible. You know what? I'll make it up to you. Let's face your fears directly by going into deep space. We'll find out about all the horrifying things that live and happen there as we'll go through each of the five levels. So get your spacesuit because we're about to go on a journey of spiritual healing, starting with level one. Now, while we're leaving Earth, what even is considered deep space in the first place? Well, officially, we'd already be in deep space once we go past the moon, which would be 384,400 kilometers from Earth. This is the exact beginning of deep space. Here, though, there is nothing special. You see the moon? That's it. A pitiful rock. Nothing scary. But when we go deeper into this first level of deep space, things start to get way more terrifying. And to get there, we'll need a quick launch with a gravitational slingshot, you know, hypothetically, and to travel at over 100,000 kilometers per hour, which sounds fast until you realize that it's painfully slow for space. With this speed though, within hours, Earth shrinks to a sphere, then a disk, then a pixel. The moon disappears even faster. And just like that, we're well and truly into the first level of deep space, what we call interplanetary space. You're now in the middle of the inner solar system. The sun is behind you, glowing like that nightlight you still need to this day, you wussy. And planets dot the space around you like little marbles. Even at the speed of 100,000 kilometers per hour, it'll take three months to get to Mars. Another 7.5 months after that to reach Jupiter, which from a distance looks majestic, striped and beautiful. But as you get closer, you can hear its creepy existence. A 1300 Earth sized gas twister of wind, pressure and death. Feeling any improvements on that astromegalophobia already, Kyle? Because even now, drifting between these gas giant planets as you approach Saturn, things aren't even that scary yet. You know what is though? Level two. But to get there, we need an even bigger gravitational slingshot, one around Jupiter. And now we're going to go 150,000 kilometers per hour. At this speed, it still takes half a year to get from Jupiter to Saturn a gas giant with rings made of a moon it murdered and a magnetic field that sounds like this as you pass it by. Then 399.5 days to Uranus, another 449.25 days to Neptune, both beautiful though, but both lethal with minus 200 degree clouds, methane and diamond rain. From there to Pluto is another haunting 10,666 hours, over a year. And when you're there, you look back and Earth has shrunk to just 0.12 pixels wide. Just a pale blue dot. Voyager 1 took a picture of the exact same thing you would see right now as it drifted into the Kuiper Belt. The farthest human picture ever made of Earth in space. And here, it's just an endless scrapyard of frozen rubble drifting silently for billions of years since the solar system formed. No planets, no light, no meaning. And beyond that, the Oort Cloud, a spherical graveyard of icy bodies stretching from 2000 AU to 100,000 AU away from the sun. That's 15 trillion kilometers, Kyle, and even now it'll take you 11,400 years just to leave the sun's influence. And when you do, it doesn't get any better. But to travel for that long, I'll need to strap you into this cryopod and send you to sleep, Kyle. Nighty night! You're now in level two of deep space, interstellar space. This is where things get extremely horrifying. From here, the sun is barely a pinprick, just another star behind you. Its light takes 579 days to reach you now. This basically means that its warmth will never reach you again. And this is where your astrophobia should really kick in, Kyle, so, you know, we can heal you. Even as you try to move towards something, there is no perception that anything is getting closer to you. Basically, you have no horizon and no way to measure distance with your human eyes. There is no way to measure progress. Yes, you can see we're moving at 150,000 kilometers an hour, yet it feels like you're frozen. Let me speed up hypothetically so you can see that I'm not lying. Okay, back to our regular speed. See, the temperature here is 2.7 Kelvin, 
The same across the entire observable universe. It's the leftover heat from the Big Bang. The birth of the universe, which is stretched thin by 13.8 billion years of expansion. Yes, the only few degrees of warmth you're feeling out here is from when the universe first began. This warmth? It's minus 271 degrees Celsius, by the way, and at this temperature, atoms barely move. You pass through thin clouds of interstellar gas, thin enough to look like nothing, dense enough to either kill you immediately or at least wear down your ship atom by atom. Erosion by molecules. And each molecule of hydrogen is traveling fast enough to act like a bullet. The sound this gas makes? Scary as f**k. In fact, Voyager recorded the exact same sound this gas could make when it encountered it on its journey. But that's the least of your problems because there is something way worse around here. Cosmic rays. These are humanity's biggest problem when it comes to space travel and are constant high energy particles traveling at near light speed from dead stars and distant galaxies, punching through everything that makes up your body, even your atoms. The consistency of these rays 99% high energy protons and helium nuclei, and there's no magnetic field here to deflect them like we have on Earth. So you're literally being penetrated while your tissue is dismantled slowly by these free floating protons. Over only one month, they would degrade your brain and even your DNA. If you could survive for about 10 to 20 years, you'd have a full tissue breakdown, organ failure, and probably some weird mutation of your cells that just kills you. It's like Chernobyl in space, you know, times a million with a 100% chance of getting cancer. Good thing I shielded the ship. You're welcome. Meanwhile, one of the most frightening objects in this level of deep space is approaching. Molecular clouds. Dark, freezing regions where stars are born. Literally black gas. You won't notice these exist until you are inside of one, as it literally absorbs all light from behind it. Which means there's no starlight that you can see just a wall of blackness that is completely opaque. We enter and it's immediately like vanishing into a real void of deep space, like another dimension. The temperature outside is now 10 Kelvin, slightly warmer than space itself, but remember, zero Kelvin is the absolute minimum temperature that physics allows, and we're still close to it. The dust around here also isn't just any dust. It isn't just hydrogen and helium to make stars, no. There's even weirder things around here frozen organic compounds, possibly. These things are basically pieces of light, the same as on Earth, but frozen in a dark cloud of despair. And these pieces, they could be the reason we exist. This theory is called panspermia, and it basically explains that the same elements that were created by stars when they were alive could also be the same elements that started life on Earth, abiogenesis. So when you are traveling through these black gas surroundings, you never know what life might exist here or who you'd meet. Eventually, you'll escape these molecular clouds and see starlight again, but it'll be as if you haven't even moved from when you entered. Your environment would be exactly the same. But space horror clouds aside, and for the sake of getting over your phobias, Kyle, the only logical thing is to think about going into deep space even further, which means going to level 3, the galactic scale. The first step for that is to head towards Proxima Centauri, as this star marks the beginning of a level of deep space where extreme space objects live and rule. This is 40 trillion kilometers away from the sun, our starting point, and to get there would take 30,000 years. Time to take another nap in the cryopod. Nighty night. And now we're here. Level three. The Milky Way is 100,000 light years wide approximately, and you've made it. 0.0000000004% across the deep space of the observable universe. Welcome to Extreme Space Object Hell. On your left, 500 light years away, a neutron star. You don't see it until it pulses, it's a pulsar, spinning at 173 times per second, beaming radiation that could boil your atoms. At 150,000 kilometers an hour, that trip would take 3.6 million years. Even with a theoretical gravitational slingshot to speed up to 3% of light speed, you know, 9,000 kilometers a second, that only cuts the trip to 16,600 years. Still insane. On your right, another few hundred light years away, a rogue black hole, around 10 solar masses drifting invisibly. The Milky Way may have 100 million of them. 
No light, no warning, just gravity sucking. Oh, 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 let's go over there to VY Canis Majoris, a star with a radius 1420 times that of the sun. Crossing it at 3% the speed of light takes 61 hours while it sheds gas into space. Now this star should for sure help your astromegalophobia, the fear of the immense size of the objects in space. But if it doesn't, let's head to the galactic core, Sagittarius A, a supermassive black hole with 4 million solar masses. The event horizon is 12 million kilometers wide, or, you know, 30 times the distance from the Earth to the Moon. Orbiting it are the S stars, the stars controlled by Sagittarius' gravity. One is even moving at 8% the speed of light, 24,000 kilometers a second. If you get too close, you spaghettify before you can scream. If you think you're safe from being far away, too bad. X-ray flares and plasma jets cook you anyway. Now stop, zoom out. You're still inside just one galaxy, one of two trillion. And that's when you ask the real question. If all of this is inside of a galaxy, what is the outside like? How deep does space really go? To find out, we're going to have to go to level four, the space between galaxies called intergalactic space. The closest galaxy from here is Andromeda, 2.5 million light years away. At 3% the speed of light, it would take you over 83 million years to reach it. But that's a best case scenario. Most galaxies, well, all galaxies, are even farther. There's almost nothing here. Well, the cosmic microwave background radiation is still here at 2.7 Kelvin, but that's all you get. No other heat, no light, no sound even though this is a local group of galaxies that surround the Milky Way. If you thought silence and nothingness from level 2 was bad, this is even worse. Not only because of the scale, but because there is literally no idea what is out here other than dark matter. We know it's there, but we don't really know what it is or what could be contained deep within it, and how it interacts with regular matter if it does at all. See, it doesn't emit light or absorb light. It just pulls with gravity and is ultimately the glue of the universe, even supporting galaxies. It is thought that dark matter is ultimately made of particles that are called weak interacting. They just flow through even atoms within your body. It's called weakly interacting for a reason. Because you wouldn't feel it, you wouldn't see it, huh? but it's there. Flowing through your atoms, your body, your bones, your brain. Yes, right now. And out here, in the void between galaxies, there's way more of it than normal matter. It forms invisible filaments, gigantic supportive structures that galaxies cling to like mold on an invisible spider web. You can't detect it directly, but if our ship starts veering slightly, if gravity doesn't behave the way it's supposed to, that's dark matter. Or worse, that's something else pretending to be dark matter. It's an invisible matter that controls everything. We've never isolated it, never captured it. It could be particles, it could be fields, but we know it makes up 85% of all matter in the universe. I mean, look at this map. Insane. These regions can span tens to hundreds of millions of light years across. If you thought deep space was empty, you've now reached the part of the universe where even galaxies don't go. This is where cosmic nihilism becomes real, Kyle. Not just a fear that you don't matter, and you don't, but the realization that nothing does. You are a drift in a web of invisible forces surrounded by particles we can't detect in a space so vast and cold that even information itself can't travel fast enough to feel meaningful. This just isn't physical isolation, it's existential isolation, where no star will rise, no signal will return, and no sense of scale will ever bring comfort again. Yes, Kyle, you found the true horror of space, not what's in it, but what isn't. Your phobia should almost be cured now, but there's one final step we have to take to make sure of it. Introducing level five, the deep space between universes. Yes, normally we would take you billions and trillions of years to fully explore, but fortunately, this is a YouTube video, so we're now going to make the trip to see the last thing to ever happen in the universe. And let me tell you, that is true emptiness. Turn on the engine. Wait, 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 what's going on? Why are you so mad? Wait. Where are you going? No, Kyle, please! I can't believe he's gone. I was actually trying to help. You are my best friend, Kyle. I'm so sorry. I might have gone too far this time if only you were still here to experience the greatness of this level with me. Where you'd see what it's like to explore the 11th dimension. Wait, I have an idea. 